All right. Hello, my name is Stephen Barr. I wanted to do the recap of our Dev Spaces hackathon we had. I'm going to bring in my friends David and Richmond Newman. I want to introduce them both. David is a principal graph consultant over at Graphable, and he is, um, we worked with graph databases uh, a few jobs ago uh, in, a, in a shared role. And then Richmond, he is an independent consultant and has been a friend of mine since way back uh, in undergraduate days at the University of Washington. So we had a, a hackathon one to just have a low key discussion. So let's kind of recap. Uh, it was really, really a fun, fun evening. We started with a, uh, an explanation of dev spaces. And then for those of you new to the live stream, it's a cloud-based IDE. And the idea is that for each of your repositories, you have a configuration file. And when you start a dev space, it'll read that configuration file. It'll populate all of your dependencies, all of the environments. It's basically you're inside of Docker and you're inside of Kubernetes, but you don't have to think about all that stuff. And then there you go. You you got all the dependencies that your development environment needs. Um, so Richmond, you've been using dev spaces for a couple of weeks now. Um, how's that been for you? I found it pretty useful so far. I do like that I can actually, it makes me actually set up my build environment properly so I can actually share my code with others. Normally I configure my own personal environments and doing such is you just create a local custom environment where nothing quite works right for anyone else. Interesting. All right. You there? Uh, yeah, yeah. Sorry. I think your uh, connection glitched yeah. for a second. Okay. So it's been... I actually gave one of the StreamYard ones, like I was running a couple Streamlit applications and those are kind of finicky to set up in Python for some reason. And I gave it to my friend and they could run it out of the box. So it was actually pretty convenient. Okay, so for those of you who don't know, Streamlit is, is basically a framework in Python where you can make very straightforward web applications. David, you actually introduced that to me when I was getting ready for a DevFlows demo. So thank you for that. <laughs> And Richmond actually brings up a good point because um, I just released a blog post about developing uh, clinical applications and prototyping them in Streamlit. But that is part of the challenge is sometimes when you are developing a Streamlit app, you need it to access resources using environmental variables that you're not committing as part of a, a repo. And using dev spaces really would get around that issue because you can inject them right into the dev space for your, your other co collaborators to work on. And it's funny how the configuration kind of grows on you. Like right when you start any application, you're like, okay, you need one API key. But mm -hmm. then like, wait a minute. Well, I do want to differentiate <laughs> dev versus prod and test. And so, okay, that's another variable. And then, oh, well, actually I have, I have dev and I've got a sandbox environment on one of the other APIs that I just started using. And before you know it, you've got like 10 environment variables and you know, it's easy to think, okay, I can manage this all in a bash script or a couple of bash <laughs> scripts. Then it quickly, uh, you get these kind of indeterminate states. Like, wait a minute, I'm using the production cache, but the, but the test database, that's, you know, you don't want to be doing that. Or I just needed to update my, uh, one of those credentials. And now how do I communicate that across a broad team? Yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> well, okay, I guess, and uh, Richmond, but I'll get back to you. How has it been in terms of uh, portability? Do you have that uh, that iPad with you? Or are you actually on I am. It? I'm actually using it for this call right now. Okay. I want to yeah. see if you could use it as a prop. Okay. But there you go. So you haven't had to lug your uh, your laptop around. Well, I have that Bluetooth keyboard. So it's... We were just having a healthy debate about it, it's nearing that time where having a fairly robust uh, uh, Chromebook or an iPad, you can still get into a CPU or GPU based infrastructure and code all without having to carry a lot of that, that weight around with you in a beefy laptop. So it's exciting times. It, it is interesting. I think one of the um, perks of employment that one people, people would want is, okay, I want my employer to buy me this awesome laptop, right? The you, the idea that you'd want some, you know, really powerful MacBook, but you really don't need it. It's a bit of a liability to like to have this uh, heavy and expensive computer when really you can just 
you really just need a good monitor and a good keyboard and do and the compute liability. somewhere else. And that liability really goes beyond just the loss of a, you know, these days, maybe a three or $5,000 uh, M1 laptop. It really goes beyond that in the sense that if you have JAMP and you're enforcing via policy uh, hard drive encryption, that's one thing, but you still have developers out there with sensitive data or PHI data for your clients and customers uh, out there to, to potentially be in the hands of someone else in the event of a theft or, or a loss. Um, a, a dev spaces negates that in the sense that no developer actually has local sourced copies of the data. That, that's a really good point. It's just, just a browser tab. Mm -hmm. All right, hold on. I, I see. All right, there we go. Richmond, I see you've rejoined. Okay, sorry about that. I touched no problem. something. I touched something. No problem. Um, <laughs> all right. Well, hey, actually, so just thinking about Richmond, your development, and again, I've known each other since undergraduate days. You've always been a, a Vim and Tmux kind of person. So how has it yeah. been using a cloud-based environment? Uh, honestly, the problem is VS Code tries to intercept a lot of your keyboard shortcuts. So <laughs> a couple of your... Particularly annoying ones, I can tell you in advance, is control Q is my preferred Tmux hotkey. So I have to go back to hitting control B, the default prefix. And possibly the worst one is if you hit control S, it pauses your terminal, but you can't use control Q to resume it. So you brick it. Yeah. I... Unless you set STTY to not do that. But this minor works. No worse than working on any other system, to be honest. You just work around it. <laughs> I have to admit, I was the same, coming from the same boat. And they, I don't know, my dad always told me, he said, you know, yeah. my .emacs file is older than you. And, you know, I, my .emacs file is as old as me because I just forked his when, as soon as I was ready. I've since you know, <laughs> made lots of changes. Um, yeah. But, yeah, certainly the muscle memory thing. But So what they're, they're working on is being able to use something like SSHFS, so you can start a dev space, but then you can start a dev space and you get the, the dependencies, the fresh environment, the cloud-based, uh, rather than your local compute. But you can use your own, your own editor. Like, you know, with Emacs, you'd use something like Tramp um, to yeah. remotely access over SSH. Uh, and then you can you still have your editor ergonomics. Well, the VS Code is is nice, and having some of the modern uh, refactoring abilities, I mean, you get that in Emacs, but it's a lot harder to set up. And what about you, David? You were a you were a VS Code. You've been on VS Code for quite a while now, right? Absolutely, and that's my my, my Emacs uh, didn't stick. You tried. You 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 gave it the good college try, <laughs> but it's been refreshing to to be able to work in VS Code in a different environment. And I really like the feature that I have the option of using the browser-based VS Code, which is a good port, uh, but at the same time, also being able to, to open up a dev space on my local install of VS Code. Um, so I, I do appreciate that. And, you know, it would be, I'm sure that there's a way to get my, uh, my environment config into the, the browser version of a dev space, but it's, I like having that convenience and that option. That, that is a good point, and I, I, yeah. I owe a blog post on this. You can have extensions and configuration that span every instance of your dev space, and so that, that would be the way to go for that. Like if you wanted a certain theme, a certain set of extensions that were mm -hmm. always on your dev space. Well, let's rewind back to Tuesday. So we, we had, we're at my living room. We had uh, you know, the, the big plastic table set up, some monitors, had a quick... Well, first, it was great to see you both again. It's been a while since we actually had a good in real life catch up. Yeah, it was so, a great land party get together. Oh, I'm, yeah, it did feel like a land party in a sense, right? You got take out, yeah. take out Thai food and a bunch of computers spread out. Although it's nice not lugging around CRTs anymore. <laughs> That's I don't awesome. know. I can remember some days where the three of us uh, on some big long projects, we were essentially set up like a LAN party around a big conference table, monitors and uh, stands everywhere, 
Uh, I seem to remember Richmond falling asleep under the table at one point. And <laughs> by that the second, after about 30 hours of being awake. Yeah, and about after 32 hours, it looked more like a dorm room than a conference room. Well, you know, if Richmond falls asleep, then it's been too much, uh, too much work. You have more uh, dev stamina than I think anyone else. Indeed. So we're doing did a quick demo of dev spaces, then shout out to um, to what was this called? Secret Savory Thai Restaurant in Bellevue. Who, uh, or sorry, in Ballard, we did uh, Uber Eats from them, and that was that was pretty good. I thought it was okay. Richmond was the with the larb up to your. Uh, you always said that's the litmus test of a good Thai place. It's a good one, but not the style I'm looking for. Pestle Rock is All right. better. Pestle Rock, okay. We will have to sample but that's this. A stylistic at... opinion. It was still a good one. <laughs> All right, we're going to have to do a, a comparison in uh, hackathon number two. And it's then... in noodle, which is next to Are we just going to order yeah. like eight larbs? <laughs> yes. <laughs> that would be a funny Uber Eats order. Because you can order from multiple rest, it'd be ex you'd, you'd rack up a bunch of fees. But yeah, you could do a big larb run. Oh God, yes. We'll, just, we'll go pick it up. I think that'd be better. That's your A/B testing. <laughs> Blind testing. Oh man. Well, so the Thai food shows up, and then David, thank you for bringing the uh, the delicious Icelandic vodka. I think that that paired very well. I there enjoyed that. Yeah, I to, I, we'll have to uh, finish that bottle off later. That was that was a blast. All right. So, all right. And then we, we each kind of worked on a project for a while. Uh, David, what did you work on? Well, I began, and need to finish now, uh, the, the spinning up of a Neo4j database and then building out a pipeline that was going to load that database. Uh, the project I was going to work on is bringing in uh, various Washington Trails Association uh, trail reports and trail descriptions and putting those into a graph so that we could start doing some graph analytics on that uh, and ultimately build up cluster and similarity analysis between trails based on not just what, how they're described, but also on user reports and then even being able to time bound them so that if you know that you want to go on a trail hike next week, you can get an insight on what is it looking like uh, across multiple different views and what people think about that as a, as a good prospect. Uh, to take you and your kids or you and your dog on a hike on this particular trail this time of year. So I, I just did a uh, put um, Neo4j online. For those of you who don't know, this is the, well, it's comparable to Neptune, I would say. Neo4j was first. Um, it is an excellent graph database. Um, it's, yeah, you can do, a graph database differs from a regular database in that you have the fundamental data is nodes and edges, and then you can do a query like select all person nodes and then all persons who are friends or friends of friends of a certain person. So it's good for social networks, good for determining relationships, good. Like you didn't want to do these like arbitrarily nested joins of joins of joins. You can find shortest paths. This is Neo for J. Uh, David you don't and like the and I entity attribute value pattern. Entity attribute. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's a labeled yeah, property that. graph, and one of its newest yeah. features uh, over the last couple of years is graph data science that you can now implement uh, everything up to a graph neural network in memory in in the database itself. So that's a, a big advance for doing complex data science. Yeah. So definitely check out. Neo4j, um, it is, it's a great graph database. It's a lot of fun. And then, all right, so back to the hackathon. So you were using Neo4j and you wanted to look at the WTA.org trails. Right. And so they up. have on their website, both trail descriptions and a, a series of user submitted trail reports that are time date stamped. So my project is going to load that data together so that you can, in graph, start to get an idea of if you're planning a hike, what is a good hike with similar properties? Uh, and if you're looking for features like I want to take my dog with me, so I'm looking for a dog-friendly hike. And I'm planning on going next week, and so I want to know what the weather's going to be like, and I was planning on bringing in weather data. 
that you can have an idea of, is this likely going to be, or what are the top three recommendations of hikes that would be recommended? Um, okay. I think that'd be a good app. And one of the things I was really impressed by that you showed me, uh, Stephen, in the hackathon is this ability, you know, I'm thinking about as I'm going through this iteratively, is this ability to have a pre-populated Neo4j database that I could bring in and load at the time of spinning up a dev space that I don't have to reload my entire ETL. I can have pre-populated databases each time I spin up a new dev space. And to me, that's, that's a big uh, uh, impact on my iterative cycle time. So I'm excited about that. I'll put a little uh, link for, for here. This is the, the repository and anyone can go use this. Um, but the idea, like David was saying, so we've got, so when, when you start a dev space, it starts this thing called gitpod.yaml. And this is basically saying, okay, how do you want the dev space to configure itself? And in this case, Neo, we have the dev space when it starts, it installs the Python driver for Neo4j, and then it will actually pull a pinned Docker image for Neo4j. It will start it with a data volume and name it. And then, so we can, we can do this right now. If we click on graph expert two and do dev spaces. Okay, so what it's gonna do, uh, it's allocating some resources. That button requires a plugin. <laughs> yes, that is a plugin. Hold on one second. There we go. All right. Yep. So you see it's starting up and then it is pulling that Docker and it's saying, oh, okay, cool. If you want a Neo4j console, go right here. Let's command click that. Okay. This takes a second to actually get the port mapping right. Um, and then here's the connection URL. Oh, there we go. So then we want to connect to it. So let's grab this connection URL, copy over here and paste that in neo for j and then careful observers of this code will have to get my password out of gitpod.yaml it is the name of a fantastic band so we'll copy that over here and then boom you are in neo for j and so this is a totally fresh instance and then if you want to do something simple okay let's let's populate this data so i have let me, populate this instance we could do here we could do let's do python okay so it, it loaded some data and i can copy this query here and then there we go that is a graph query running in a fresh neo4j instance And so there's still some work to be done on this project uh, as far as the loading of that database, as well as uh, a interface that ultimately would be built in Streamlit. Uh, but they'll at least this will get you up and running with a database, a Neo4j database running alongside of a project with some example code about how you might go around uh, or about loading in the data. And ultimately, we'll update this repo to include a Streamlit interface uh, as well as some other features. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing that. Maybe we can uh, we, we can do a Pestle Rock comparison and and I guess finish up that repo and yeah, see, get that uh, get that going. Excellent. Cool. All right, so that'll be yeah. uh, on your GitHub. I'll, I'll post that whatever's there. And send me that link to that blog post too. I'd love to. Uh, put a link for that. That's really interesting. I'll send it to you while we're talking. Cool. What about you, Richmond? What have you been working on? Well, do, helping you out getting ShotStack to work for these automatic video editing. That was oh, the yeah. main highlight of the hackathon is making that a little more generic and support more different transitions. Uh, okay, so in, our, in my AWS Made Easy Ask Us Anything live stream, we've got some automation that runs. And we use this really cool API called ShotStack. And what that does is you can give it a JSON structure of a video that you want. You can have it combine different pieces of different video clips, add an image, change the sound. And we have some automation that will make the highlight clips. <laughs> I just 
I had to remake my episode uh, 21 clips because I accidentally <laughs> made them without sound. But um, yeah, it's overall, it's going really well. Having that automation yeah. made the process a lot easier. Yeah. Um, Shopstack's pretty good at API. I like it. Here, I'll post that here as well. I always like to give credit where it's due. Here's shotstack.com. I'll post that as a banner, shotstack.com. Yeah, so how so if you want to edit videos programmatically, definitely check that one out. Yeah. Uh, it's been it's been really, really useful. All right. So using dev space, like what what other advantages have you had besides I suppose not having to deal? I guess it's been nice. Because I, I know that we've I've given you the shot stack API keys and we're able to just build that right into the environment variables. So you don't have to worry about worry about that. I don't know what other uh, I don't know, advantages of Dev Spaces have you seen um, while working on this project? Well, I know it one that from I've computer posted. to computer with. That's probably the number one advantage. Well, I posted on my Twitter the uh, the oh, cool sorry, photo of right. the um, of the you working from the iPad from the um, from the bakery. I think that's pretty cool. Hey, that's always fun. <laughs> Actually, one thing that I've really liked about that is, um, and coming from rural Australia, especially. Um, you know, if you're going to be working from a bakery or, you know, just on the go tethered to your phone and you do something like NPM build, uh, it's really nice. That that's not actually coming to the <laughs> physical computer that you happen to be on or even. Oh, well, that's like, pretty true. Oh, like well, in rural Australia where our Internet was, you know, 4G and not that great. Yeah. Some of the NPM builds can pull in gigabytes of stuff and saying okay i'd rush yeah. rather pull that data into you know us east one than uh across the tiny little narrow drinking straw of an internet connection that i had out there yeah but you might also notice my dev space by default also installs very large packages like ffmpeg and pandas and scikit just by default just because i'm afraid of having to build it when i need it but that's not really a fear because the internet on the instances is fast enough that it's not that big of a concern. Yeah. For, for, hey, um, I need, do you mind if I take a two minute break? I will be right back. Yep. Right, so if, while he's gone, I'm curious to, yeah. in the dev spaces, looking at like, let's say I want to spin up a, in a non Docker way. I'm wondering if you can spin up a Jupyter, you know, I'm trying to think about how would I spin up a Jupyter instance to also be working in there without having to do it via a Docker container running. Uh, um, you can install it natively and Gitpod will expose the port when you turn it on. So you were do like a, a pip install Jupyter and, and yeah. then uh, natively, as long as you don't have port collision, it should come up on 8888, yeah. Yes, and you'll get 888 prefixed with your instance, but you'll also have to tell Jupyter when you launch it to what that link will be, or you'll get a cross-site scripting error. Yeah, it's not so very I guess hard you to resolve. It, would you tell it 127001? Um, because you don't really have the IP or the URL dynamically, or do you at, at, at build time of a dev uh, you It will generate a dynamic URL for you. You I wonder if our local host one twenty seven zero zero one would work. What that URL will be? Okay. Got we, it. Were, we were just talking about you could how also would we uh, pip install you and have run? A web browser running in the Git pod. Yeah, pip install and run automatically a Jupyter uh, server, and of course have the browser, and then have the environment all set up that Jupyter was listening in on the right port and had the right IP or. URL. Uh, I, it's like a two-line script. I can send. I can send it to Stephen, and he can make a blog post about it. Jupiter Dev Space, love it. Okay, so this is my attempt, but Richmond pointed out, and I'll, I'll share this code that there is a a bit of a danger here. Let's, let's don't keep open our... star. Don't show them that. Show them the right way. Okay. Well, you send it to. All right. Yeah. <laughs> so this this is slightly dangerous. This allow origin star. That means oh, yeah, when yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. 
yeah, you open this dev space. <laughs> Anyone can connect to your Jupyter notebook. Yep. So but how are you? How are you going to dynamically update that to one twenty seven zero zero one or whatever you're going to do there? Server IP zero 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 zero. Yeah. And disable the server token. And then I've got the script called print Jupyter URL. I don't remember. Oh, wait a minute. Before you, before you do that, um, go back to uh, your setup there. Keyboard. Yeah. So instead of a uh, app token like that, you can also set server app uh, password, and you could actually preset the password, uh, which would be just another protection in the sense that even if someone did come across, or if, if you left it uh, allow origin, um, if you set the password here using dot password, then they still wouldn't be able to get in without your password. And you can even set a default token here. So they'd have to then also hack both yeah. uh, password and token, because I actually preset both yeah. in that same concept. But you can set it up to magic you to point out origin or the server. So it will give you your instance for the ports it exposes, and you can put that into the Jupyter or J commands to launch it. Do you have um, do you have a repo I could look at? Is it uh, public? Uh, I think it's a script in that root of that giant repo that I did. So if you go to numenores dev space hub, and I'm starting a a dev space uh, this one. Get. Is that a mono repo? Newman RS, and then where to? Uh, slash dev space. This guy. All right, we're having a like few. Um, choosing to cut out disturbances in the force for one second. There, yeah, uh, yeah. Let's, let's call it a disturbance in the force. Not in the All right, so this is your git pod dot docker file. Uh, go to dev. Okay. Yeah, go to dev. Yeah, go to just the root of dev space. Okay. I think it's just jupyter.sh. Okay, yeah. Last file on that list. Here we go. There Port 8888. There's probably yeah. This seems way like a that. smarter and better way to do this. <laughs> okay, I will yeah. uh, I will There's update. There's other ways to get Come that on. URL. There's a git pod command that apparently generates that URL. I didn't know yeah. that, so I just found the environment variables containing enough information to find and replace the port number. But I effectively, every time you open a port, your instance has a name, and it gets a URL associated with that name. And when you open ports, it prepends the ports to the link. So it'll be like this HTTPS 8888, and then the name of your instance. So the command is GP URL, and then you can do a port one two three four. Uh, let's pick a more elite port. Oh, fantastic! There we go. Yeah, and that generates that. So then I have this script called print Jupyter URL, which is if Jupyter Lab didn't open, click below, and so you can run. Okay, nice. you click this one, and because mine's wide open to the world, there we go. So there, there you've got Jupyter Lab running from a dev space. I will do that update um, to make it a bit more secure. And I'll have Although, to send you um, uh, a similar concept, uh, Stephen, where I create a, uh, a networked doc series of Docker containers of a Spark cluster that you could run locally. Um, and what it ends up doing is it creates a Jupyter server uh, in a container and then three Spark containers, one master and two workers. Uh, and now you have four containers that gives someone the ability to work in a PySpark Jupyter notebook and start uh, practicing and using a local three node cluster uh, all right there in their their dev space. That that's a really interesting point. Mm -hmm. And because you have full access to Docker within dev spaces, you could yeah. do that. That would be let me, let me put this back on the screen again. Oops, uh, add to stream. There we go. So you could do Docker. Yeah, Docker I do Docker PR. Compose. Yeah. You have Docker Compose dash version. Yeah, we checked. Yep. Okay, cool. 
So I can give you a repo that spins up, like I said, a a four container network. One's a Jupyter server pre-built with PySpark and some other uh, nice tools. And then uh, three other nodes in separate containers uh, that then gives you the ability to start working on a local Spark cluster before you can then test and get everything going. And then you can just use your, your either your Jupyter notebook uh, or just an additional bit of uh, uh, Python code. And you could do a Spark submit to a real EMR or some other Kubernetes managed uh, Spark cluster that you have running even up on Databricks if you wanted. But you've been able to test that locally. Huh, all right. That would be really cool. Now, do you know what architecture the containers are? I mean, we've got a dev spaces that runs on Graviton and we've got another one that's x86. x86 oh. is fine because again, these are just local install uh containers you're you know you're not going to be running massive jobs on this it's just yeah. to test your spark your pi spark code and and to ensure that you have configuration set when and i would do them on smallish to test data sets uh recently we were doing this where we had to process xml files that are you know 150 to 250 gigs in size and we tested them on much smaller XML files, got it all working, and then did the Spark submit, uh, submit to a real cluster. That's, that's really cool. Um, and I think one of the advantages is all that stuff, right? In the moment when you're setting it all up and you've got all the, all the little bits and details in your head of exactly how it works, but then you move on and you, know, you always think, okay, I'll remember, I'll never forget how this worked because I put so much effort into it. But then a week later, you've done something else. You, you just, life goes on. And you, like with this whole pot Jupiter thing, I had no idea. I remember figuring it out once, it worked, get committed. And then I think if my brain was, was S3, it'd be mostly Glacier. <laughs> and so, you know, it got archived into the, uh, the long-term low-cost storage pretty quickly. Well, uh, you just go straight to Stack got... Exchange, and it tells you exactly how to open all your ports dangerously. <laughs> well, that... I'll, even, uh, I'll one up that story there for you, Stephen. So in this very example I was talking about with this local Spark cluster, I thought I had this thing tuned perfectly, and I needed this other developer to get in and start working on this big XML file project. And I was like, I've already got a Spark cluster up and ready for you to start using. Just clone this project and you'll be set. Uh, they cloned the project and tried to spin it up with Docker Compose. And I, I quickly realized a couple of things where my, my planning had just fallen apart. One, that presupposed that the developer knew how to use Docker Compose. They didn't. I didn't really need them to know how to use Docker Compose. I just needed them to know how to use PySpark and they did and they knew about Spark clusters, but they didn't know Docker Compose. So I had to step back and walk them through how to actually spin this up. Um, and then they had Docker installed, but they didn't have Docker Compose installed. And so all of my planning really still fell apart because there was that, that disconnect. The, the second thing I discovered, and I've now had to go back in and refactor, is I built these images on and M1. And I, I thought, okay, I'll just port the image and send them the image and just have them load that into Docker. M1 built images won't run retrospectively on, on older Macs. You have to build a multi-architecture Docker image. I now know how to build a multi-architecture Docker image so that when Docker runs, it looks at your local architecture and says, aha, pick this one, not that one. But I wouldn't have had to have done all of that if I was, had been using uh, dev spaces, that would have solved this developer having to really now take on all of this additional cognitive load just to work in an environment using PySpark, which they already knew. Well, I'm, I couldn't make a better case for it than that. And then I, I agree, like, you look at the, um, you know, people always say, why, why couldn't you use these you know, simpler tools? And then I always kind of refer them back to the original Hacker News uh, the show Hacker News uh, post about Dropbox, where it's like, hey, look at this thing I made called Dropbox. It's for synchronizing files. And I'll, you get a lot of people, a lot of the responses, like, oh, you could do this with rsync. You could do this with SSH keys. Like, yeah, you could, but there's a reason why what? that wasn't a well-solved problem. <laughs> of course you do. 
get <laughs> and and for a one person thing right but as soon as you move it out into like oh here's a person who doesn't know doesn't understand networking or ssh keys or uh the power to do something destructive right you can really you can have a big blast radius we always talk yeah, about our sync uh, is not the safest definitely no <laughs> We always talk about uh, limiting the blast radius of your mistakes. That's what I like with dev spaces, right? You can you can have exactly the environment variables are kind of you can figure the environment variables outside the system, and then that way you know when a dev space launches, you're like okay, this is the environment variables that are going to exist, and there's the computer that it's running it doesn't know doesn't know anything else. So it's not like oh, I could have ran some other script somewhere else and had this other SSH key or AWS key on, and now I've done something bad on my iterate and delete everything from S3 scripts. And it would be a really dumb idea to write one of those. Oh, here, I wanted to share, I saw this on uh, the IT Reddit. That I had Active Directory over <laughs> accident to delete some random user when I was selected in another window. So I have someone that can't log in. I'll fix it when I know who it is. And it's again, it's that whole like limit the blast <laughs> radius. All right. If you have Active Directory open and you're an admin and you can delete people, you know, be very careful about that. I'm sure we've all we've all made mistakes about dangerous things in production before. I mean you have to learn somehow. I've done get surgery before. I don't think I've deleted too much. I have written too much. I've written a script that spent too much. Ah, yes. In AWS, that's easy enough to do. Uh, well, Raul and I, we just no, no, we didn't just we didn't get to it. There's a new one for service quotas on AMIs, mm -hmm. where and it called that out specifically. It says it's really easy to write a script that will generate ten thousand AMIs, uh, and so now you can service quota your account to not do that because you probably don't want to. Right. We've actually written a Lambda and then that. set that to CloudWatch events that then goes and checks the status of like uh, workspaces uh, and invalidates that if there hasn't been any activity, shut it down. That's what we do at, at DevGraph. There's a basically, the, well, there's in the whole company as a whole, they had about 40,000 AWS accounts under management. Hmm. Uh, and so they've got some pretty neat tools for automatic garbage collecting and um, checking to see what resources are actually used. Because it'd be really easy. I mean, imagine that many different resources all, abil all able to spend money, right? They, but that's another discussion. Yeah, that's another discussion. One of the things we implemented. And, you know, again, I think that something like Dev Spaces addresses in a very unique way is when we were using EC2s or other um, um, you know, ways of uh, developing and orchestrating compute, uh, how do you start then tracking the cost impact? And so we then had to come up with mechanisms to enforce tagging so that when we looked in, we're a big AWS house. Uh, when you look at AWS Cost uh, Explorer, that you can then start getting meaningful analytics on not only the individual, but the client or the project uh, that is driving a, a particular cost trend that you see in your account. And I think, you know, that, that kind of overhead, you don't have to really think about as much when you're doing sort of these ephemeral stated uh, dev activities. Uh, I love the, um, the analogy we call cattle, not pets, where it's like you don't, you don't want to babysit these uh, environments and keep them around a long time. You just want to have, a, you like the idea yeah. of the environment. Right, and you like the process. It's all about the yeah. process of how do you get this environment. Well, um, one thing about the Git pod is it creates the instance for you, and it times out after 30 minutes of activity. So at a lot of places I've worked in the past, they just tell you to spin up an EC2, do your thing, and hope that you remember to turn it off. That's right. Yeah, and then you get that angry email at the end where it's like, you left uh, 32x large running <laughs> over the weekend. And we, we would have that. We had data scientists at another company that I worked at. And, you know, we, we gave them enough rights to be dangerous. And in retrospect, that wasn't always the best idea. 
and told them it was fine to spin up an EC2 and test that experiment. And because they didn't make that connection, you get some data scientists, for example, or it could be any role, I'm not gonna pick on data scientists, uh, that they'll go, sure, that R4X large, and, uh, or hey, let's test out that new P. Uh, let's run that. And then not knowing to turn that off, you're right, you can drive cost pretty quick. Um, and not having the ability to, to enforce policies like 30 minute activity shut down, you're ephemeral. Um, and in dev spaces, that's really a nice feature is, is that your dev space may shut down, but it was nice to then be able to go back to my dashboard in dev spaces and realize I didn't really lose data just because I've got to get commit or do anything. I still have, as I come to learn from Steven, 14 days in which I can still spin that space back up and it has managed and kept the state of what I left it when I, when I let it go and expire at that 30 minute timeout. So this is, this is what mine looks like to kind of give some visual to what David's saying. So I have all these ones that have timed out um, and just, you know, different experiments I've run. You know, I want to make an experiment, doesn't pan out, just close that tab and then let it get garbage collected. And then see this one, it'll age for another, like this one, cyan hyena. I had this one running for a week while I was playing with this thing. Um, but they'll all age out, and then eventually, like this one's going to get garbage collected in two more days, and you don't have to think about it. And all of these, I look at each one of these things, and yeah. this is like, oh, this is a time where I didn't have to go back and clean up my environment. Um, the, each one of those things. Yeah. So that, I'm I'm happy about that. Yeah. You see, you see, I've got my Jupiter one running here. My what is this Graph Expert two, and same thing. I'll just let them time out, and they'll be they'll be gone. So don't have to worry about that. David, you use Docker quite a bit more than I think I do. What's mm -hmm. the most disk space you've had on your local from all the cached images? Well, and that's another nice aspect <laughs> of dev spaces is I typically will go and because I'm, I'm, I'm a bit uh, retentive in this regard, I'll go and do a, a Docker prune and which will essentially tree shake out images and, and other things that aren't being used. Um, okay. And, but that's not common practice. I think most people don't even know what Docker Prune does. And so they'll end up with, you know, a significant portion of their drive being consumed by images and, and more often orphaned images and volumes. Uh, and, and so there's a lot of that management you have to do because they still haven't automated that. Um, yeah, I, so I've, I've seen many like junior data scientists going around and they have like a terabyte hard drive and it's at least 600 gigabytes of no longer used docker <laughs> yeah it can really add up i mean it's it's almost worse than video editing like it really can well, add not up. that bad well oh it could be <laughs> yeah no it, i mean yeah i do it's funny richmond you mentioned that i don't really miss uh that having to deal with that um yeah, that's a really good point. Well, there's I think this has been a really. Oh, go ahead. Oh, oh so there's also that second thing, and a lot of Python developers. I actually find it probably better practice to spin up a new instance and install a clean Python than it is to try to fiddle with Python's virtual environments. I'd rather just build a whole new environment. Yeah, I think we had talked. Specific. We talked about that the other day, right? It's really frustrating to like python has all these you know pi env and virtual env and they're not the ergonomics of them are not pleasant to work with and even still it's only one layer of consistency and it doesn't give you consistency on the os layer on the hardware layer any of that and there's some better tools out there these days you know you look at things yeah. like maybe and also, i think like, poetry yeah but it's still they're they're still all wrappers that require again, a developer to have this overhead of knowing how they work. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's just one well, I less... I personally like using PyEnv. But if mm -hmm. you know how to use PyEnv, you might not know, be fully familiar with the commands to operate Conda or whatever. And some people run specific Pythons like Numba. So if they hand you a mm -hmm. Git pod for their project, they've done the DevOps so you don't have to remember or can at least look at what their script install did so it leaves yeah. notes and hints of how it works 
And for example, I use all of my Python code. I now configure with, configure with uh, uh, I, I would say Facebook, but now it's Meta's uh, Hydra configuration. And not everyone knows how to do that, nor should they really have to understand it. But uh, now in a, in a uh, dev space, I have the capability to, to deploy that configurations there. I can tell them just edit this file and they don't need to know the black box of how that configuration is being implemented. Exactly. And you don't need to remember, you can just pause it in time. And then later when you come back to it, you just hit that button and it's, it's back up and running. And, and meanwhile, you haven't clobbered your environment variables. Some one thing that you put in your bash RC that made it all work that you've since clobbered or forgotten or done something else. And all of a sudden you're, you're back on stack overflow and, uh. <laughs> Oh, I've definitely had environments taped together with a bad, large batch of symbolic links. Cool. Hey, well, David, I know you need to run. Thank you for joining us. Really, really appreciate it. And send me that blog post. Uh, definitely. You have it now. In oh, cool. All right. I'll put that up on, on the show notes. Oh, there we go. Streamlit tutorial, how to build applications in Streamlit. Let's put that on, on the banner. And uh, yeah, I'll put it in the show notes as well. This is really cool. There we go. There you go. And I, what I do in... On macOS, right. you just take a, take a screenshot of that, and then you can immediately select the text. Um, nice. You don't have to like transcribe it real quick. All right, well, thanks for joining. Really appreciate it, and uh, have a good weekend. All right, thanks you for too. having us. Looking forward to our next hackathon. Yes, we're going to do uh, part two, and we'll do um, Pestle Rock this time. And Sin Noodle. All right, there you go. Well, I think, I think we have noodle. enough. Sin uh, Noodle's pretty good. I think they're the, I still wonder if they're the same ownership. I'm going to look that up. <laughs> all right. We have to all right, see. We, we've got some research to do. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. Have a good one. And uh, we'll see you next week.